All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. And uh, it's great to uh, have this opportunity. Uh, my name is uh, Gene T. Chavez. I'm a historian in residence here at the Kansas City Museum, for those of you who may not know that. Uh, and uh, I've been associated with the Kansas City Museum since 2013. And it's been a, a great uh, opportunity, I think, to get the Mexicano, Mexican American, Latino story out to a general audience uh, here in Kansas City. So I count it a great pr uh, privilege to be associated uh, with the Kansas City Museum. And uh, so what uh, this program is, is a series of two sessions, this Saturday and next Saturday, exploring um, Kansas City, Missouri's um, Latino community, especially the Mexican-American immigrant community. Uh, and uh, we have a very special guest with us today to talk about uh, some of that history, because we lived yeah. that history, as did some of you who are in this room. So uh, we like to keep it informal, and uh, maybe as we go along, uh, there may be some questions or uh, comments that you want to make to add to the presentation today. So feel free to do that. Just, you know, raise your hand and uh, you'll uh, be acknowledged and we'll go from there. Our guest is a uh, former state uh, representative from the 23rd District, Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, and um, he tells me that his real name is Raul, but he goes by Paul. So uh, he, he can talk about that. Uh, Paul G. Uh, Rojas uh, grew up in Kansas City, Missouri's west side. And I'm hoping if, if the slides become too distracting, we can shut those off, but if you can focus on both, that would be great. Uh, so um, his uh, parents came here during, uh, I think, the period of the Mexican Revolution. For those of you who have studied uh, Mexican history, uh, you know that the uh, Mexican Revolution was a result of seeking uh, more opportunity for the poor people of Mexico. Uh, Porfirio Diaz had been dictator of Mexico for over 50 years when uh, the Mexican Revolution broke out. And it was an effort on the part of the people to bring about some equality within the Mexican society. And of course, nat uh, internationally, the uh, Bolshevik Revolution uh, was happening in Russia, and the same thing against the Tsar and his uh, living high on the hog while the poor people, the serfs of Russia, had to struggle to just live daily. And, and much the same thing was happening to the peones in Mexico. And uh, so it was an uprising, the Mexican Revolution, that lasted from 1910 to 1921 was a period of time when over uh, 900 million plus left Mexico uh, traveling north uh, across uh, the border. And let me say something about the border. In 1821, when Missouri became a state, the border between Mexico and the United States was at the Arkansas River. And if you know the Arkansas River, down there they say the Arkansas River. So the Arkansas River was the border between the United States and Mexico. So we have a long history of presence, of our presence, in uh, this part of the region. And so we're going to talk uh, a little bit uh, about uh, people who came, uh, especially during the Mexican Revolution, and came to the United States uh, to find opportunities. And many of the people that left were, were not uh, peones because they didn't have the means to do it. Everybody understands the word peon, right? It's the peasant class, yeah. Uh, and it, it's not peon, it's peon. <laughs> so uh, I, I would uh, urge you to use the word peon instead of peon. Uh, even though maybe they were at the lowest rung of the, of the uh, Mexican society as well as Latin American society. But uh, many people came, many of the people who came were intellectuals, were uh, lawyers, doctors, and others, much like the Cuban Revolution that left. And so uh, the people who came to Kansas City, Missouri's Colonia Mexicana, and which, by the way, stretched not only in the west side of Kansas City, Missouri, but all the way over to Armordale, Argentine, and Turner, 
that was all part of the Colonia Mexicana. Uh, as Mexican immigrants came and found work in the Santa Fe Railroad, cut a hay uh, meat packing and other meat, meat packing, swift meat, meat packing plants, and uh, many opportunities for work, and many of them worked in um, actually the hospitality industry, hotels, restaurants, and so forth uh, here in the Kansas City region. So uh, with that brief uh, history uh, and, and uh, context of why people came to the Kansas City area, uh, which started way back at the Santa Fe Trail days to the present, uh, we're going to get started and uh, have Paul share with us some of his memories of growing up in the West Side. So, uh, first, uh, Paul, uh, when did your why and when did your parents come to Kansas City, Missouri? I'll just uh, that was my dad and uh, his first wife, and she died. Uh, I guess it must have been in the early, very early twenties. Very early twenties. Uh -huh. In fact, that picture of my dad that they showed here recently. Uh, I wasn't born yet. Yeah, with, with the string. I, yeah, I don't even know if it was taken here or in Mexico. <laughs> And there's some other pictures that are shared with him that I can't find uh, other people that came with him from Jalisco at that time. And uh, don't forget, a lot of those people were involved in La Guerra Los Cristeros, uh, you know. Uh -huh. You talk about religious persecution. Don't forget that the communists had taken over the revolution under President Calles. And I guess the United States looked the other way. Guys died like a big hero in San Francisco. Uh, of course, we hear all these beautiful stories about uh, uh, Caleb, you know, but she was part of the communist movement in Mexico. Yeah, we didn't follow. In fact, Leon Trotsky, who was supposed to be the successor to uh, Lenin, the competition was between Stalin and, and, uh, and Leon Trotsky who was in Mexico at the time at the invitation of uh, Diego Rivera, the painter. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were part of the communist movement down there. And uh, the persecution against the church forced a lot of people here. But some took up arms. Some movement in the, within the church took up arms against the Mexican government. And it was known as the Guerreros Cristeros, or the War of the Christians. And many forcefully had to make their way up here because I think I got a picture of, I got a picture somewhere in my house from uh, U.S. News and World Report of some reporter who did take a picture on every telephone pole. Every, every priest who was not of Mexican born get out of the country or get shot or hung. And the telephone poles are like that. I have it at home somewhere. Mm. Like those pictures I want to share with you that yeah, I can't yeah. find, you know. Right. Our history is so rich and a lot of it is not told. You know, just like here in the United States right now, they're trying to subvert a lot of our history, American history in the United States, that it don't exist or don't talk about it, don't use it in schools. Now, now they've got a, a big fight over it, even Huckleberry Finn. Yeah. So, uh, but, uh, Yes, we need to document our history. And uh, I wish Gene Chavez would have started this uh, some 40 years ago or maybe sooner, you know, when so many of, uh, of those that were here much, much earlier than everyone in this room uh, could share that story. Their, own, their story is our story. And talking about that, Paul, you know, uh, the... Uh uh, Missouri Valley Room of the Kansas City, Missouri Central Branch Library is a rich resource for our history because, for example, all of the tapes that Irene Ruiz did with some of the old timers you're talking about, including yourself, uh, are recorded in, uh, in uh, uh, audio tapes, uh, cassette tapes, that Irene used when she was working at the library. Well, those tapes also are on the internet because I've heard some some of those tapes on the internet at yeah. home. Yeah, yeah, you can actually go online yeah. and go to the Missouri Valley Room right. and 
uh, you know, go, go to that section, you might need to call the library and say, hey, I need help finding Irene uh, Ruiz's uh, tapes. And yeah, you can listen to them online. You don't necessarily have to go down there. Cody yeah. Alonso was on there, and uh, Julia Gutierrez was on there, and, and uh, Lopez, Ruth Lopez is on there. They can read them as well. Yeah. 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 So if you, uh, you know, want to explore history, uh, that's a great opportunity, a good place to start. And she could have used a lot of help, too. She would, don't forget, she was, as an employee of the library, was doing it, this on her own. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and uh, that brings up the fact that I think that all of us have stories to tell, and all of your stories are important, and, and it's important to share those. And, uh, you know, the uh, story sharing area just outside of this room, uh, that where we have various pictures hanging up and so forth, that will be an area here in the museum for you to come, share your story, have it recorded, and become a part of that uh, history, um, storytelling tradition. So um, that's one of the things that we have planned for uh, that particular area. And, and if you see uh, people that you recognize up there, pull off the card, turn it around, and see their story, because we did interviews with everyone who's... Uh, pictures hanging there, and then we had them come to the museum and take a, a good photograph, and then uh, they're part now of our storytelling section. So uh, feel free to, to do that in the future as we open up that part. Well, Paul, let's, let's go back to your parents coming from, uh, your dad and, and his first wife coming uh, here from Mexico. Yeah, I guess the, they lived in what they used to call the La 24. That was the name of the West Side in them days. 24th. The 24th, because the 24th Street was a main corridor for a lot of activity. And uh, the West Side was known as La 24. There was no West Side then. Uh, uh, yeah, they came here, of course, like many others, you know, I think a lot of them came through Holiday, Kansas, you know. Holiday, Kansas is not there anymore. But it's the opportunities for uh, their hiring at Swift or Cutting Hay or Santa Fe, the Hotel Mill Bach or whatever, you know, they would come into the city and, uh, and go to work in those fields, you know. And, uh, of course, their professionalism was very, very just to the side, you know. Uh, uh, they, many of them have were professionals, too. As you can see in that picture with musicians over there, that means that, that picture there was taken, I used to tell people, you know, if you know where that picture was taken, I'll give you a thousand dollars. You know, a lot of people don't know it, but here in Kansas City, one of the best photographers, a uh, very good photographer, friend of all the, the Italian community, had a, a Photoshop and he took pictures of weddings, weddings, baptisms, and uh, him being Italian, the cultures are very similar to ours, you know. And uh, because of the Catholicism and what have you, you know, baptism, how we do things. And uh, he, used to take, he took that picture with a backdrop on it in the basement of Guadalupe Church. Oh, wow. That, that, that's where the picture comes from. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, the, that uh, Photoshop burned down many years ago. And all the negatives and everything that we used in them days, well, they went in with a fire, you know. Do you remember his name? No, I don't. Uh, yeah. I wish my brother was here because he could, and a lot of other people, of course, because they used, a lot of people, he got us in the weddings, they used his service, you know, for wedding pictures, and I see his picture from the 20s, and I would not be surprised if he did those pictures, you know, wedding pictures, and uh, there's one in the church basement of Mr. Arredondo, and his wedding picture was many, many years ago, and I would be surprised if that Italian gentleman did, did that, you know, but, uh, uh, this. Yeah, my brother used to say when you go to a strange town, Paul, you want to find the thing many years ago. But if you find it at the Mexican community, follow the railroad tracks. Because and, and if you want to look at our history, where we settled in every year, every place, Holiday, Kansas, because uh, there was a big uh, place where they, uh, the Santa Fe and the uh, Union Pacific across the river uh, had housing, you know. They were converted box cars, and people lived in those box cars as long as they worked for the railroad. My wife was born in one of those, 
And there was a doctor who would go around and deliver babies when the time came and stuff like that. And uh, that was my way. And you know what? And when my wife was born in a boxcar in Holiday, Kansas, uh, the doctor did not record her birth. <laughs> and so she was not a citizen for the longest time until later on in life when she needed to have that. And that took a lot of red tape to get that corrected, you know. And I said, Kater, you know, Mary, they might deport you. I'll have to go back to Mexico with you. <laughs> but uh, she was born here. But uh, we can go on and on. Those, those stories are very similar. I'm sure if you search your history, the same story can probably be repeated uh, to one member of your family, you know, down the road or or things like that, you know. But uh, uh, but the other, the hub, the railroad hubs were a big attraction for building the railroads. And Union Station, but much less of labor went into building this Union Station here back in the very days. Um, but uh, we could go on and on and on and on, you know. Our parents left us with a, with a rich history. And, uh, Paul, what was your life uh, like growing up in the West Side? Well, start when you were uh, at, what hospital were you born in? We'll start there. I, I think I was born in General Hospital. I'm not sure. But, uh, or it could, it could have been at home. There was a yeah, many, many people. There were midwives and everything. Uh, my story is a little bit different than most people because my dad came here with his uh, his uh, his uh, best buddy in Mexico, and they went on to become uh, compadres. His best buddy in Mexico was Pedro Briseño. Some of you in here may may remember him, Pedro Briseño. Remember Teresa Briseño yeah. and all them girls, yeah. uh, Vince <coughs> and uh, Frank. Well. Uh, Mr. Briseño uh, and my dad came up here together. They became compadres, and uh, fortunately, Briseño died young here and not by some accident there in Kansas City. Uh, but my wife, my, I mean, my dad's wife died, you know, so he remarried uh, my mom. Just naturally, he married my mom, and uh, uh, Whose name was Mary, right? No, no. My, my mom's name was Adela. Adela, okay. Adelita. <laughs> but in any case, uh, unfortunately, she had breast cancer, died from it at the age of 35. Oh. Uh, me and my brothers were born, and this is 1939. So, me and my brothers, we bounced around, having no relatives. We didn't have no relatives. You know, what's, my mom was gone. We had my dad and each other. But my dad had some compadres, and uh, we went to live with different compadres, with different padrinos. The people who took me in shortly after my mom died was Maria and uh, uh, her taro, the senor taro there on monitor. I lived in that house many years ago when I was little. You know, they took me in. And now my brothers went to live with another godfather and another godfather, you know, until my dad brought us back together again. And time went by and, and we got together. In fact, they were going to send us to Boys Town, you know, because we were all, all over the place. But it didn't happen, you know. And, uh, you reformed before they you sent you off to Omaha. <laughs> they would have, you know, and I, I might have lost my language and who else knows what, you know. but. Uh, but I, I, remember, I know somebody else who came from Boys Town. Yeah, her dad. Tom, Tom came from Boys Town. And, you know, I don't remember if he lost his language. No? Because we all used to speak in English, me and him. But uh, I, I, don't, I don't mind my emotions. You talk about that. You know, those are not the best days, you know. Naturally, we were all coming out of the Depression in the 30s, you know. And, uh, Time was not very good for anybody in the United States, and maybe around the world for that for that matter. So, uh, and they were not especially very good for us who had obstacles to climb, you know, or jump over or run from. Yeah. So, so I'm going to ask you about those obstacles. Uh, were they based in segregation uh, that uh, Mexicans experienced? Well, I'm sure there was, but at that early age, you probably—I did not recognize it as such. You know, I know about the name calling, the the 
the places you couldn't go to and stuff like that, you know, and the adjectives that were used, but uh, didn't pay much attention to it, you know. And uh, of course, the same thing was uh, uh, discrimination against people is not new in this country. I mean, the Irish suffered that very big. The Italians suffered it very big. The Polish went through all those, you know. But they mingled a little bit easier than we did, you know. Yeah. And even today, we're not mingled all that much, you know. Sure. You know, too many people, you know, I'm, I'm an illegal, you know, still, you know, and uh, the, the, that. And that's to say nothing of the, uh, of the African-American people. That, that's, that's especially true. Yeah. Especially true. Because uh, the West Side, as we know it today, you know, produces some, a lot of good people. Gates, the Gates family barbecue, they're from the West Side. They're from the West Side, they live there in the West Side. Gates Barbecue, we can go on and on. The, the gentleman who owned the Green Duck, was a, the Green Duck, the original Green Duck, was on 24th Street. Leon the Jordan. Green Duck was owned by Leon Jordan, the political figure who helped found Freedom Inc. Of course, he got, he got assassinated for his political participation. But uh, the threats were made even against me when I was doing my thing, you know, along with a lot of people. But, uh, um, because we were a politically controlled people. The blacks were as we were. We were politically controlled. And so uh, we had to knock that wall down, and we did. It wasn't easy. But uh, those barriers had to come down in a different dimension downtown, in City Hall, in the courthouse, whatever. Because I the time, because the only association we have with government in them days and before, the draft board, the tax collector, and the police department. So uh, that had to change. We now we've had even a Mexicano police commissioner, and uh, with a little effort we can get another one. Uh, so the, things are not all that nice, you know, and. Uh, here, we, here recently we had a meeting with a, one of the police commissioners. I did, myself. In fact, it was at Eric Guadalupe Center, and not that many years ago. Uh, with one incident that took place with a department, a police department, and uh, it's, the seeds of hatred have been being planted here in the United States for some time. And it raises its head, runs again. And one of the commissioners at the time, a good friend of mine, I call him one of my Hebrew brothers, who is uh, uh, still around, an attorney who was on a police commission, brought the chief of police down here so we could talk about some of the things that need attention downtown. And uh, I said, some of the things that are going on, when are they going to start wearing brown shirts again? You know, you know the story about the brown shirts. The brown yeah. shirts in Europe. Fascist, yeah. Fascism, mm -hmm. that's yeah. right. From the brown shirts, they went into the Gestapo. And there's movements right now going on that are not all that kosher. Uh, I'm sure as a democracy, we'll be able to, uh, we'll overcome it. Might, might hurt a little, but. But in any case, that's what it was. Uh, well, I grew up and, uh, I even went, uh, I worked in the fields, you know, stoop labor. Uh, where, where were some of those fields located? Uh, how, um, Morris, Kansas. They used to come and pick us up there on Jarbo and Holly in a truck, and we'd go over there. And uh, I worked on everything that grows around here in the fields. Everything that grows here from from cutting potato seed in the, in the cellars, you know, get them ready for planting the potatoes. That happened along Turner, around the Turner. Oh yeah, Morris, Kansas. All the, all the bottom land down there, they were all farms. Here, <coughs> over there, up to Corning, Missouri, all those, uh, all the bottom lands, they were all farms and uh, truck farms, they called them, I guess. And, uh, but uh, they hired a lot of guys like me, you know, kids like me, you know, for uh, everything that grows around here, I worked in that, you know, and from then, I remember one Easter Sunday, I was working, picking radishes, and uh, my brother told me, hey, you want to go work as a busboy? I said, hell yes. 
Hey, <laughs> <laughs> better than stooping over a field. Oh, they yeah. love with a yeah. time radishes with a rubber band. But, uh, but yeah. we could go on and on and on and on and on. And well, let's talk about some of the organizations that developed in the West Side. Um, uh, what do you remember about Dorothy Gallagher? Uh, oh, Dorothy Gallagher was... And, and Maddie Rose, I don't know if you ever knew her, but... Well, no, no, Maddie, Maddie Rose was a... Passed play. away, actually. No, Maddie Rose used to be on, on Mercer. Yeah. 23rd Mercer, I think, the, either right close to where Baldasso live right now, there, and yeah, that's where Maddie Rose was. And it was a clinic serving the, the Swedish community that was prominent there in the West Side. In fact, I think... We bought the church from them, you know, as they, they moved out of the area. As we moved in, they moved out, or they were moving out anyway, made properties available where we, you know, began to buy property through the efforts of Mr. Elizondo. Mr. Elizondo was a real estate guy, and uh, he helped a lot of people, you know, find a house, you know. And uh, But... Uh, Going to Dorothy Gallagher, did you... Uh, but, you know... I never did meet her, but she took a lot of pictures, and she's got a picture of me that she took with me and my one of my brothers. And I think that one is that one is hanging there. At the, at the, well, I got it in my house. I don't know if I should. I got it on my telephone, but uh, I'll share it with you later. Uh -huh. But uh, Dorothy Gallagher was that she was just dynamite, uh, a woman influential. She wasn't poor and uh, wanted to do something to help the immigrants here in Kansas City, Missouri, from, and namely in her west side. And yes, she did. And there's a picture I think maybe might be in here. The one time, one time, uh, how she was effective here in Kansas City, Missouri. This is a true story now. Uh, she came about. She found a, a notice somewhere that they're going to have an ethnic festival in a White House lawn. I said, hell yeah, shit. She decided she's going to take some people with a little talent, mandolinas, dances, a costume. So she took some group of people, which uh, the picture there in the, in the center. Mm -hmm. the, 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 there, in the, I don't know if it's in the White House lawn. I think it is. So she took that group of people to Washington, D.C. for the ethnic festival, and they stole the show. <laughs> <laughs> and so Dorothy Gallagher uh, said, you know what, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who put that together, uh, said, you know what, if I'm ever in Kansas City, Missouri, I'm going to visit Guadalupe Center. And lo and behold, it just happened that uh, the political control machinery in Kansas City, a movement was started by the Citizens Association, and their symbol was a broom, sweep the crooks out of there, you know. And let's face it, the mafia was very much involved in it, you know. And they decided to clean house, and they did. And the first person to become mayor under that flag was name was Gage. And uh, there was no Gage Park, though. He just had to come there, and he had to welcome uh, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt to Kansas City. And I uh, guess they were going to take it through the Broadway, which was a very exclusive street, down to the plaza, and stuff like that. And she said, no, I want to go to Guadalupe Center. And she made it to Guadalupe Center. And actually, all of us in our Easter best, which was some of barefooted, you know, there's a picture that, I don't know, do you have it of, of uh, us? Kids, little kids, a bunch of us in the street wanting to know what the hell's going on here, you know, all the commotion and stuff. And the police department with a Dorothy Gallagher, she asked the mayor, where do these kids play? He did not even know the area, really, you know. You know? You know, so uh, Dorothy Gallagher says up there, we didn't call it Gates Park, we used to call it the Hill. The Loma, huh? Yeah, the hill. Well, it was in English. We, oh, in we English. Never, we, we call it the hill. <laughs> yeah. And uh, whatever we want to do up there, baseball, whatever, you know. And, uh, but it was a landfill. I don't know if anybody remembers in Kansas City, they had streets that were made with wooden blocks. They had streets that still had wooden blocks. Creosote in them and everything. And they, that hill's got a whole bunch of us in there. 
the hill became bigger, you know. And uh, after that, the mayor decided to flatten it out and uh, put dirt on it and stuff. And uh, so they called it Gage Park. But it was never Gage Park for many, many, many years. It's recently that it became part of the park department, part of the park, you know. So uh, that's why it's Gage. That's why it's the Gage Park because of the mayor who had just got elected on a clean sweep and kicking the crooks out of the city hall and the courthouse too. You know, the remnants from Pendergast and what have you, you know. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's how Gage Park got his name. Uh, and, uh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, that's one story that, that you know, things that happened good yeah. in our way, you know. Right. That, that's, that's a vision that Dorothy Gallagher had for us. Yeah. Paul, uh, how did you decide, when and how did you decide to become politically involved? I was in grade school. Uh, me and my buddies, uh, we, this guy had a girlfriend. This, uh, not a girlfriend, this girl he wanted to see, you know, and uh, there was three of us. Uh, so uh, me and the other one, when when we found a hubcap, hubcaps were a big thing to have. The pretty ones, you know, sometimes they hit a bug. Spin, spinners and all. And the hubcaps. This was a nice looking hubcap. This guy picked it up. We're walking down the street. The police department said, "Where are you going?" Well, we're just around here. We're going to see our buddy. He said, "What you got?" He said, "You got a hubcap." My buddy had a hubcap. <laughs> and we're in grade school, you know. Uh, he said, "Where'd you steal that at?" We found it, you know. Mm -hmm. He said, what you do with the other three and stuff like that, you know? Yeah. And you know, they actually arrested that guy. So we, I went, he didn't tell his mom and dad or nothing like that, you know, and stuff. And uh, we, we went, we went to, to the municipal court. In the municipal court, the judge naturally, his name was, I don't remember his name, as many years ago as it was, I don't remember his name. I think it was Browse. But, uh, the judge. Yeah. But in any case, uh, he gave a good, both of us a bit, speech up and down, you know, cause, not because it's out, you know, but he was nasty. And we're walking out of the courtroom. I guess I spoke too loud. I said, how did that guy become a judge? <laughs> <You know? laughs> he said, well, some days they used to uh, elect the judges, you know, that's because you just, you know, the, 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 party, the, the party people, the, the organized people would, and like a buddy of their own to be a municipal judge and a circuit court judge and on and on and on, you know. And uh, we don't have that today to that degree, but uh, he hurt me. He hurt me. As we go to hit the door, and they call me back. What did you say? You know, this and that. I said, well, well, I guess he hurt me, you know. And how the hell did this guy become judge, you know? And so. That was my first experience, and uh, I found out how he got to become judge. I said, well, let's see if we can change that from down the road a bit, you know. And uh, that was my, best, my, my first experience in be becoming aware of the political system. Like in the school district, it wasn't working for us. We have uh, a charter school. In fact, it's the second largest charter school in the state. And the reason we have a charter school is because the public school system not addressing our needs. And before not that, just us, but the black community too. So, uh, and the charter school system came about, so uh, it's, it's grown from to where it is today. And, and again, with many obstacles, it's only in the last session that uh, finally school, charter schools just got full recognition. They were not being funded in the same level per capita income as the public school system. Only this year it happened. This year the governor signed it into law that the charter schools will receive per capita equivalent, you know, per, per pupil as they do the public school system. For us it's about, about $4 million enhancement. And, and for those that may not know, uh, probably the uh Charter school that is operated by uh, Guadalupe Centers Inc. Uh, probably started out as the Guadalupe School, grade school. Some of you attended the Guadalupe grade school. 
No, it didn't start that way. It not, didn't start that way. Not, okay. to, not to charter school. Gilbert Guerrero. Well, I'm talking about then uh, kind of evolved into Alta Vista, where yeah. Gilbert was involved. Yeah, the reason I got the name of Alta Vista because there was no room for us anywhere, and Alta Vista alone in their basement. That church, Vista, that church, that Alta church Vista right church. there on Twenty Third Street. They loaned us their basement. Okay. And we were doing school out of a basement, Alta Vista basement. Right. That was the name of the church, Alta Vista. I think it still has the same mm -hmm. name. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, it's a name, Presbyterian church, I think. The, the name uh, stayed with the school until recently. Until recently, it became Guadalupe, Guadalupe Charter School. And uh, the kids in high school wanted to stay with Alta Vista until they graduated, you know. As it phased out, Alta Vista student phased out, the rest of them coming in as freshmen and stuff is. Uh, Guadalupe, Guadalupe Center, you know, charter school. When was Guadalupe Center started by Dorothy Gallagher and her um, Catholic Association of Women? Yeah, the ladies, the ladies, uh, that ladies uh, that had a a club, Osberg Club, I think it was called. Yes, in one of those pictures. Yeah. When they had the fiesta yeah, the it's there. It, and the, the rectory was their headquarters there. The rectory there is now. Uh, but in any case, uh, I'll think of the name her, her quick, you know. Yeah. That's going to, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, uh, uh, it was known as the Casa Blancas. There was a little, a little bunch of row houses there, and they were all white. Little ones there. Now, were they on Jarbo or were they on 23rd Street? 23rd Street. They were on 23rd Street? Yeah, and they were known as, uh, uh, they had like daycare for uh, infants, you know, stuff like a daycare. And, uh, they did a lot of things for babies and stuff like that, you know, helping the uh, young women. And and, uh, and the sports and stuff were not completely in there yet. They helped, yes, I guess, you know, with, uh, with a little bit with the, uh, Documents that they might need attention to, you know. That is a brass band that that orchestra, people that found that orchestra. What that club name is up there on that, uh -huh. by the doorway. Up there. Uh huh. In any case, uh, yeah, they, they were they were Guadalupe centers were known as Las Casas Blancas, and as, as the houses went away, and the center was built by Dorothy Gallagher, and she lived there actually. And the downstairs and everything was used for, uh, you know, I think I had two basketballs, one didn't hold very much air, you know, but that was the extent of the athletic program. But, uh, yeah, that's, it was known as the Casa Blancas. Even after, after the building was built, a lot of people didn't say Guadalupe Center, they called it Casa Blancas. Our grandparents called it Casa Blancas. Yeah, yeah. Las Casa Blancas. Mm -hmm. And a lot of good things happened out of there, you know. And uh, I was a beneficiary of a lot of things from there too, you know. I, I ran the streets and what have you, like a lot of us did. And uh, and they used to bring us clothes from the orphan home. The St. Joseph orphan home was up the street, you know. And uh, so that was a plus. Uh, well, and they had uh, manual arts and all kinds of other programs eventually. Uh, so Guadalupe Center started in 19. 19, yeah. and uh, so it's already uh, <clears throat> over a hundred years old. Wow. Yeah, so and, and it's still operating, uh, uh, of course, under um, uh, after Dorothy Gallagher started it and was called the Godmother of the West Side. Uh, she yeah. she has uh, her legacy lives on. Yeah, and we came under the community chest. You remember the red the red? Yeah, it was a red the red flower. Red, red, red. It's a red feather. Feather. Yeah. Feather. The yeah, red feather campaign they used to have here in Kansas <coughs> City to help um, to some degree as much as they could distribute some money to Guadalupe, places like Guadalupe Center here, Don Bosco and other places, you know. Uh, it was a red feather campaign and they grew into something else. And, mm. Let's go back to uh, your. Um, involvement in the political process as an adult. How did you happen to get elected and not just happen, but how well, did you maneuver? Well, yeah, we started working one precinct at a time. <clears throat> you know, uh, helping somebody get elected or working against somebody to not get elected, you know. <laughs> uh, one precinct. 
and then I have to wait until plan for the next election to work another precinct. You know, there's so many precincts in every ward, and we were part of the the famous first ward in Kansas City. It had a the first ward in Kansas City was a powerful word because it was a controlled area, like the second ward was in a black community, a controlled and uh, those uh, ward healers, as I called them at the time, sometimes the ward healers, uh, that element that did the controlling, uh, use, use it as a claim agents that I can do this for you, governor, or that for you as a favor in return. Always, always something personal, you know, something they, for themselves, you know, nothing filtering down anywhere. So as, uh, as uh, Freedom Wink was beginning to get formed, and I knew all the guys at Freedom Wink get formed them, and Leon Jordan played the price. Uh, we too were forming and uh, over here, and uh, it had different names, you know. Uh, in fact, I did to in helping Bobby Hernandez. I uh, I uh, I uh, I used uh, knowing that the Northeast area was predominantly Democratic, you know, in every election, you know, and the city elections are not partisan. So I, we printed a ballot with a, the official Democratic ballot, you know, <laughs> and used it in the Northeast area. They didn't know this. They thought we were going to be isolated, only working on this side of the city to help Bobby Hernandez get elected. But no, overnight, everybody who they think is going to be working in, in, uh, in uh, in this part of town, throw them all over to the northeast area. They're not expecting nothing. When the polls open in the morning, every poll in the northeast area will be manned with a, a different ballot and Bobby's, Bobby's uh, little brochure, you know. And, and it worked. Now, for those that may not know, Bobby Hernandez was uh, elected to the city council, yeah. Hispanic from the west side. Uh, yeah, elected the first Hispanic council. elected to the city council. And uh, after that, I guess Alex Presta, who had been living, retired in Hot Springs, Arkansas, was called back into Kansas City to, uh, you know, fix up the damage that was done by those crazy Mexicans, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so uh, at that time, the Jackson County was run by a three-judge system, a western judge, an eastern judge, and a presiding judge. So prominent figures from Kansas City who want to see a change, people like Charles Kirby, George Lear, and others. Charlie Wheeler was another one. At that time, you know, the thing about the graveyards voting on election day, or dead people voting was true. But in here, probably nobody knows. Do you know how they did it? No. The coroner was an elective post, and the people in power would run a man of their favor for coroner. Now, a coroner's job is to verify the death of a person, you know, even today. The coroner verifies the death of any person. And he's supposed to turn that name in to the election board so it can be stricken from the post, from the roster. Well, that so-called guy, coroner, would not do that. The coroner would uh, know all the names, what part of town, which ward, which precinct that person lived, and he would give that name to those ward healers, you know, the people that organize political clubs whose interest was not our interest. Mm -hmm. And those names would be used by anybody. Mm -hmm. I'm John Green, I came to vote, John Green's dead, but they don't know it. Because the name hasn't been turned into the election board to be stricken. And they would not turn the names in until after the next election, after the election. And do it again. Between now and the next election, people die. You know, they're registered voters. They will vote if it's in an organized part of town, you know, uh, or, you know, politically organized part of town. That's the way it was done. Until Charles B. Wheeler, when they changed it from uh, the three-judge system 
to the representative form of government, and I, and I worked for that change, you know, that, that they would cut up the county in uh, different districts, and uh, so people, we, we would have a representative form of government, not just three judges and in a in the coroner and uh, the tax collector, but uh, Charlie Wheeler, being a doctor, he's the first guy that ran for a, uh, for a coroner, and he did away with that. No more of that holding on to the names and giving them to the war healers, or that's why he used to call them war healers, you know, or political bosses, and uh, Charlie Wheeler did that. And, and, that's, and it's like that today now. The coroner will obey the law, strike the name of a given person who, who died, you know, and be stricken from the polls. And we can go on and on and on and on. And now you became the first representative, Mexican and only Mexican uh, representative of the Missouri State House from the point. Right. There was a big question there. I mean, I have the the news clippings from the Kansas City Star. What was going on politically? Uh, we had the charter form of government became, well, the Jackson County became charter form of government, and having worked uh, on that, helping on that change, along with uh, guys like Jim Nutter, like I mentioned earlier, very good civic-minded people who befriended us, you know, uh, and, and uh, I already mentioned Charles Curry and George Lear, and I uh, can go on and on and on and on, but uh, I spread the rumor that I was going to run for the county. And one of the biggest uh, tricks in politics, Paul is going to run for the county, we'll find somebody with a similar name and run him. Run him, you know. But one thing I didn't know about Presta Incorporated, those elements, when they endorsed somebody, they kept their word. Come rain or shine, whatever. They stuck with that person they endorsed. And, uh, yeah, uh, Pat Reels was a good ball player, fantastic ball player, you know, like, like other guys his age, you know, and uh, he, he played ball against many other groups, you know. The, the Mexican teams? The, with the Italian community stuff, he played ball against all those guys too, you know. Yeah. Uh, we had good teams, we had damn good teams. And uh, yeah, they, they picked Pat Reels to run for the county. So Paul Rojas had to run for the county. Election year. Paul Rojas with the help of people like, I don't know if you remember, Joe Shaughnessy, who was a con our councilman, became a good councilman, and he died ironically early, uh, an architect. And I had a friend by the name of Paul Edwards, an attorney who was working here to help us, you know, change, change, the, change you know, that we too have a right to have a footprint, you know, in a political system. And so uh, I and a Hebrew cousin of mine, Joe Kenton, went to Jefferson City and we filed for the house. And I was going, my opponent was going to be Alex Fazzino. But Alex Fazzino was living in a district of a gentleman by the name of Bill Royster. And so it just happened that Bill Royster died and Fazzino went and ran. Uh, I didn't have to run it because Fazino jumped over into his real district and ran from there, and he still had problems with our uh, residents. According to the records, Ellis Fazino, state representative, and uh, Jasper Brancato, state senator, were living in an ABC market upstairs in one room. That was their official address. I don't know if you remember ABC market there on 12th Street? Yeah, that, that, was, that, was, that was their residence, they said. Rankato lived on Ward Parkway. Fazino lived on Pendleton, you know, here in Northeast. Not too far from here. But, uh, uh, so that's what happened, and I, I worked hard along with the help of so many people, you know, and, and got elected to the Missouri House. Pedro's got elected to, to the county uh, legislature, and Bob Hernandez was sitting on the city council all at the same time, which uh, they didn't appreciate that. So, uh, Alex Preston come back from Arkansas, and uh, yes, we had a meeting about working together instead of fighting each other. I, Pat Rios, and Alex Preston.
So we're, 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 we're working front to that end, you know? And, and our ballot looked exactly the same except for one judge. And uh, he said, we've been, the judge, he, he didn't want to get out. He'd been a uh, municipal judge for a hundred years. He'd like, you know? But uh, they stayed with him and he got reelected. We were for somebody else, but uh, that was the only difference in the ballot that year. But I didn't notice that before the meeting was over, Alex Presto reached into his pocket and put a pill under his tongue. Well, you know what that is. Nitroglycerin. Yeah. And we were gonna we were gonna work together, you know. Well, we, we I mean we were about to break it with, and so uh, now he died about three weeks later, two weeks later, something like that, and so uh, then. The club became another name and another name, and then it was Gilbert Guerrero who said, let's, let's name it La Raza Political Club. Gil Gilbert Guerrero was a visionary. That school was there because of Gilbert Guerrero's vision down the road. And his spunk that I'm not quitting, well, I'm going to fight, I'm gonna go, we're going to get it done. And it grew and grew and grew and grew, and uh, now we have many professional people helping us you know, along the way. Uh, doing things and making it grow some more. Just, just one facet of it. And you, you, you know it, but the many other parts of Guadalupe Center that do so many things, you know. Many things. From teen pregnancy and on and on and on and on, you know. Don't mistake teen pregnancy with abortion. No, no. It's, we're helping people have a good, you know, healthy finish, you know. Paul, uh, we're going to pause here and ask the audience for uh, any questions they might have. If you do, don't be bashful. I, I, uh, yeah. I'm and not very good at saying things until uh, somebody brings me a question, you know. Yeah, and uh, since this is a two-part series, we're going to invite Paul back uh, next Saturday, the 6th of August, uh, to finish up, because we, there's a lot we, we still haven't talked about. Yeah, please bring it up. Unión Cultural Mexicana, and don't talk about it now. But uh, the fact that he uh, signed up for uh, the U.S. Navy at age 16, just turned 16, uh, when he, he uh, joined up for the Korean War. So there, there's a lot of other things we need to talk about, but we're going to stop uh, because our program runs till 1130. So we have um, some minutes uh, to talk about any questions you might have. Yes. What is your overall impression of America, the good, the bad, and the ugly? Well, I guess it's still the land that everybody wants to be part of. It's still the, the great land that it can be better and better depending on us. Yes, yeah, the hope and dreams of everybody. Uh, this, uh, I see people today doing very well economically, doing very well, who by their hard work uh, happen to own businesses here, big land properties in Mexico, which is well, you know, they couldn't own, have both, you know. Uh, we, we politically, you know, we, we were able to name uh, the regional director of SBA at one time. We, 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 of course, I had to make phone calls to Denver, Colorado, to speak to the speaker over there and other states around us, you know. Do you guys have anybody in mind for a regional director of SBA? Economic development is a big, big part of our history. It should be. Somebody said a long time ago that only three words move this country. Politics, economics, and social. Under those three words, everything comes into it. the social need for Guadalupe centers and other things, uh, economic, uh, not just employment. If we had those fights, you know, with uh, agencies throughout the government, you know, about their hiring practices, we can start with hiring practices. But yet, also for those who want to endeavor into the into the field of uh, interpre inter be interpreters, business be community, they too should be able to make a bid on some of those contracts, or a piece of the contract, according to his ability to fulfill that, you know. 
and um, and the social, everything else comes under there. We're okay there. We worked uh, from the top to wherever. In fact, Hector Barreto Jr. became the the metal, metal big guy of SBA out of Washington, D.C., nationally. Yeah, and his dad proceeded with the founding of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and then oh, the okay. National Hispanic Chamber yeah, of Commerce. Yeah, and I was there with him, myself, yeah. uh, Hector, Joe Lera, uh, uh, Richard Barrera, uh, and there, was, there were others, you know. You see, in Chicago alone, there were 26 chambers, Hispanic chambers in Chicago alone. So you know what happens when 25 guys are the, are the kings and they go downtown for a package or part of a contract or this or that. Well, let's tell them they're plain English. When you guys get your shit together, you know, uh, we can talk business, you know. You got 20, 26 guys saying they represent all the economic development in the Hispanic community in Chicago. No. Narrow it down to one Hispanic chapter in each city in one national chapter, the overall umbrella. And it's like that to this day. You know, we have here Carlos Gomez, which is an excellent guy running the Hispanic Chamber in Kansas City. <coughs> and uh, both sides of the border now, you know. Uh, but we can, uh, economic development, uh, economic development or the opportunity to be part of it, you know. Uh, and, and it's happening. Uh, look at Rodriguez. Uh, 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 I guess you could call him a plumber or whatever, but he's a master mechanic, which is known as the highest place you can go as far as uh, uh, plumbing in the plumbing industry. Now he owns a big company. Whenever built down or anybody's bidding on a major job or the state of the airport, for example, here's my credentials. I'm going to bid so much of that job or all of it. Rodriguez, Paul Rodriguez is doing that. And we can get into carpentry, the roofing industry, and these guys doing well. God bless them. I'm for it. Yeah. Any other closing questions? Yes. How long did you serve in the house? Four terms. Four terms. From one year to what year? Uh, the late the late sixties and early seventies. Thirty seven. And uh, I I had the audacity to get invited to Washington several times. I've eaten in the White House. <laughs> how, how were you received in the Missouri uh, uh, legislature? Uh, at first, uh, the guy with the white hat, because of the circumstances surrounding my uh, election, uh, the audacity to uh, take on those elements that were powerful and, uh, and survive them. And uh, at first, uh, I wore a white hat, I guess, so to speak. Uh, but. Uh, but once in a while we would joke too, you know, if, if Paul if Paul Rowe has a seat on a telephone, well, there's the Mexican caucus is having a meeting, you know. <laughs> the, the Mexican caucus of one, you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you can have fun too, you know. I mean, you got to laugh at yourself once in a while. But that's true. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, di I didn't, well, in Jefferson City, I, I pick up the telephone book and visited as many Hispanics as I could in their houses at my off time. How you doing? This and that. <clears throat> well, I'm Paul Rose, I'm from Kansas City. I'm not your representative, but I know your representative. If there's something you need from the state and I can help you, I know your representative and uh, go for it. And, yeah. uh, and, and one time, this is good, one time having a brand new elected guy, I knew of Buck Strauss, who was the chairman of the Democratic Party in Washington, D.C. Robert Strauss was a very guy open to new ideas, and he could see that, yes, Hispanics in mean, this country are going to be a party to be reckoned with. And so I called him up and I told him, you know what? I'd like to have the names of every Hispanic, and we knew that there weren't many. In, in the center, we only had the, uh, uh, Senator Montoya from New Mexico. Uh, Governor Castro. Uh, yeah, and uh, a, a, a few in the House, and uh, Henry Gonzalez uh, in, in San Antonio, who we used to meet at the airport once in a while, you know, just in between flights, we would invite him to meet at the airport. 
But uh, I asked Bob Strauss, I need the names of every Hispanic elected from state level on up, state representative and, and state senators. So maybe we could have a powwow somewhere in the middle of the country. And I knew there weren't that many, but there were some. And uh, he said, I don't have that list. He said, wow, you've got a list of every secretary of state. And every secretary of state has a, is responsible for all elections in the state, in every state. He said, we just uh, sort out the Hispanic names, and uh, uh, we'll take it from there, you know. And, uh, and it got out of hand. I, it got out of hand. When they found out about that, because uh, at that time we had a powerful guy in Washington by the name of Kika de la Garza. He was the chairman of the Agriculture Committee in Washington, D.C. I mean, that's power. The agriculture of this country got to run through him. As far as legislation dealing with uh, agriculture, got to go through Kika de la Garza from Texas. And, uh, but even then they wrote us off as insignificant. There was Cameron and Roy Ball from California, <coughs> who was great with us, you know. And, uh, so we did have a meeting, but then we had it in Washington, D.C. By then, everybody who was elected to it, as a mayor from a little town or wherever, they wanted to be part of it. So through the efforts of uh, Robert Strauss and a gentleman who was working within the campaign of Jimmy Carter, uh, Joe out of going out of, West, out of Los Angeles, whose family owned a big uh, retail and furniture, uh, found us the hotel room and stuff, big enough to house houses. And by then, everybody wanted to be there. The mayor for year from Miami, uh, the guys from Richard Daly's companies in the Chicago, uh, Irene Hernandez in, in Cook County ran on, ran for, for a seat in the city council of Chicago. What they call, I, I call the city council, I think, got another name from Irene Hernandez, ran countywide over the objections of Richard Daly and won. Yeah. And on and on and on and on. And here you are. We heard so many stories that uh, emboldened us, all of us, you know, in that room, you know, as uh, people presented themselves and what have you. And, and uh, from there came a birth of an organization known as Naleo. And Naleo was supposed to be for elected officials, you know, uh, from state representative or not. But now everybody. Uh, who wants to be part of it can be part of it, you know. Like we got Beto Lopez, who is a councilman at uh, in, uh, out here in uh, Lee Summit. Lee Summit, yeah. He's a mayor pro tem, and he belongs to Naleo. It's a national association of Latin American elected officials, you know. But uh, and we can go on and on and on and on. Yeah. And we're we're going to stop there for this session. Uh, let's give Paul a hand. Yeah. Yeah. History there. I mean, we <laughs> we got a good dose of it today. Thank you, Paul. So and you know what? Me. You know, don't don't give up the ship, man. Because uh -huh. uh, like I said, you know, I was you know, the, so many, so many of our parents who who could uh, you know uh, tell us so much, you know, that to be recorded, you know. So right now it's tradition, and the best that we can remember. I know my older brothers would have a lot to tell me, Paul, that, you know what this, you know what that, or, and others who had older brothers, you know, who have a lot to say, you know, like if Pat Reels was here, uh, I could name you a bunch of Melitón Gutierrez was here. I used to ride the streetcar downtown with Melitón Gutierrez, who was civic-minded. After getting out of work from, I think, of the packing house, we'd go to City Hall in a streetcar, only to get beat, beat up, you know. <laughs> but, uh, but he didn't give up. Yeah. Yeah. But there were other guys, Sal Gutierrez, his brother. And, and, uh, we can go on and on and back. Have we had those guys to document something like this gentleman is doing? You know, and uh, I'm sure we're going to leave a whole lot of things out. But uh, uh, let's, let, let's not forget who we are, where we come from, and where we can go. Right.